psychotherapist revealed. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We are pleased to feature Andre Marquis, one of the leading voices in unified psychotherapy. Andre is an associate professor at the University of Rochester. His teaching, research, and scholarly interests include psychotherapy integration and unification, emotion-focused therapies, developmental constructivism, group therapy, relational psychodynamics, and integral theory. Marquis is author of four books, including Integral Psychotherapy, A Unifying Approach. Marquis currently serves in various editorial roles for national publications and is on the advisory board of the Unified Psychotherapy Project. He has taught more than 40 courses in psychology, counseling, and human development. Thank you so much, Andre, for being with us tonight. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, I'll kick Take it, it off. away. I'm taking it away. Um, <laughs> my first question is, I would like, uh, Andre, if you could explain uh, briefly um, your integral psychotherapy model. You have a wonderful two by two diagram in your head and in my head. So um, go for it. Explain to us. Okay, so like you know, any any uh, meta theoretical unifying model attempts to be as comprehensive as possible. So it's it is difficult to talk about these in sound bites, but I'll try to do my best. So, uh, so I draw from Ken Wilber has this integral theory, and he's not a clinician or a psychologist, but it, his model has been applied to dozens of fields. So I am applying it to psychotherapy and. Uh, he has these five main constructs, so these four quadrants, these developmental levels and lines, uh, states like affective and defensive states, and then the self system. And so it sounds like we'll focus mostly on the quadrants. So this, they're um, pretty remarkable, really. So it's this intersection of these two axes, the individual and the collective and the interior and the exterior. And you, you know, when these two things are combined, you have the interior of an individual, like their experience the exterior of an individual, like their behavior, the exterior of, the exterior of the collective, which is like systems, and then the exterior, the interior of this collective, which would be like culture and meaning making systems. So um, the key thing here is that this is really like, even like Michael Mahoney, who, you know, Jeffrey knew, um, another one of these really big thinkers like Wilbur, you know, he, he thought this was one of the most parsimonious models ever. Like it, it, it's so simple and yet it really is capable of accommodating and integrating virtually everything. And um, what it really shows is that these, these four quadrants situate very divergent, apparently contradictory perspectives in a way that they actually augment and complement rather than compete and contradict with one another. So I've applied that quadratic model to many, if not most, kind of aspects of psychotherapy from patient variables and uh, like assessment, you know, I have the integral intake, the etiology and treatment of psychopathology, we wrote a book on that, uh, to therapeutic interventions, so like um, general treatment principles, but also I have that taxonomy that classifies over 200 interventions um, with, according to the four quadrants and with three developmental levels within each quadrant. And then it's really, really, I think Greg Henriquez, the other big unified thinker, says the strength of integral is actually in its uh, epistemology. So, you know, the way that research is carried out in psychotherapy, I think is deeply, deeply problematic. I've published a fair amount about, about that. And <clears throat> I think that there's increasing recognition that not only is pluralism, like methodological pluralism needed in psychotherapy research in general, but especially if you're trying to study a unified psychotherapy, it's an absolute, it's absolutely essential. And so, um, I will wrap up here soon, but I, we, I have to quote our friend Jack Anchin, who Jeffrey wrote a book with called Unifying Psychotherapy, and he said it's axiomatic that methodology constrains both the kinds of questions that can be asked as well as the kinds of answers that can be provided, right? And so I was super fortunate to, um, Michael Mahoney was my mentor, and I also took several uh, independent studies with him on epistemology. And a few of the key takeaways were that like the nature of our subject of inquiry, like in this case, psychotherapy, that should guide our choice of and rationale for our methods. But in contrast to that, most traditional psychotherapy research like tends to impose a methodological foreclosure upon inquiry into any kind of subjective or ideographic meanings of people's suffering and things like this that are so you know 
the whole point of psychotherapy. And they, they, they insist on one narrow form of empiricism, the experimental design and these random controlled trials. And as if that's the gold standard when you're missing so many of the important aspects of process research, you know, et cetera. And so I, I, I could go on big time, but you know, the, the big distinction here is between the empiricist quantitative paradigm and the qualitative hermeneutic paradigm. And that's exactly what the vertical axis of the quadrants represents. And then there's also a significant difference between a focus on decontextualized individuals in contrast to the, those who are contextualized with you know, systems. And that's what the horizontal uh, you know, axis separates from. So, um, so again, the quadrants provide a very sound logical rationale for why we need methodological pluralism, right? You have empiricism in the upper right quadrant, phenomenology in the upper left quadrant, hermeneutics in the lower left quadrant, and systems and ecological analyses in the lower right quadrant. They just they just pop out like that in the quad. Well, so. and I know, Andre, like uh, when, when I've been able to like listen to you speak about your uh, work, also read your work, uh, as a clinician, it's been it's been fascinating to see how I can like apply uh, your perspective to, to the actual work that I'm doing with my patients. And so you, I, I've, I've, I've always enjoyed like seeing all of this come to life in the psychotherapy session. And it actually applies. It, it actually does. It's just, I think it's, it's difficult though. Like when we talk about it, there, there's so many academic terms that, you know, if somebody isn't like really up to date on what all the academic terms mean and doesn't have like, you know, a thorough uh, background uh, in, in, in different theories, it's, it's hard to kind of uh, be a part of the conversation. But, you know, I know when I've cracked open one of your books, all of a sudden I can see it with great clarity. And one thing that you do that I, I believe sets you apart from other academics is you spent a lot of time looking at video segments of psychotherapy and really like paying attention to like what, what are clinicians doing in a psychotherapy session uh, that that's helpful to, to their patients and then also validates um, the, the work that you're doing. And and so that that's been really helpful to me too. So it's sort of like I can like learn from a theoretical perspective, but then also learn from a clinical perspective and then bring it all together. Like when I'm meeting with my patients, uh, it's been really helpful. Well, I really appreciate that. And, you know, you and Jeffrey were responsible for getting me in and meeting Davin Lou, and that's been a whole rabbit hole I've been going down. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, so <clears throat> I can actually make a segue here. So, you know, the meta theoretical perspective is, is, is in many ways about zooming out to get this, you know, 10,000 foot view of everything. How, how do all the mountains fit together and relate? But there's also a profound value in zooming in. And so um, not only have I been studying tapes for a long time, but, you know, I've been in supervision for the last five years with two different ISP supervisors. And so all my own sessions as a therapist are being videotaped and, and critiqued and supervised. And um, a zoomed in thing I'm doing right now is actually uh, with my current supervisor, we're, we're writing a paper that the working title is uh, Practicing ISDP as a Person-Centered Approach. Mm -hmm. which, and, and, and the subtitle is it's not an oxymoron because, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it tends to be so technique and therapist driven, but I really think it's best when it's really, really person-centered. So, so I'm really zooming in on, <clears throat> you know, the affect and defensive systems which is not completely comprehensive, but it's an incredibly important part. And um, yeah, get, getting critiqued and studying, you know, tapes. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, that's how I know that's how you started out with Lee was to you know really study moment by moment, you know, and rate, rating the ATOS scale and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, for for me, when I first started working with Lee, which was in gosh the early '90s now. I, you know, I just watched video segment after video segment after video segment and just kept on coding them with, with the ATOS. And, and over time that taught me a lot about psychotherapy because it's not just about the one session that I would watch. It's the many sessions that I would watch and just see, you know, what the interplay was between the therapist and, and the patient. And, you know, one thing that I've enjoyed about your work is like you, you mentioned like person centered, and I've always thought of you as quite relational. I mean, like you really do have like a Rogerian 
respect for what's happening for patients who are suffering and and trying to figure out how to alleviate that suffering um in in like a kind caring way and uh and so that that's something that you know i i've always had to like kind of pause with and just recognize when when you know you have shared your perspective all, all these years at CEPI conferences and and with the books that you've written Kristen, can you just tell the viewers what the atos is yeah, so the ATOS is a coding scale that is used for qualitative research. When you have a video segment of psychotherapy, you can use the ATOS in order to code. For? Oh, achievement of therapeutic objective scale. Thank you. And and real easy, all you're doing is is trying to see if the patient is aware of their defenses, right? Motivated to change their defenses, able to access affect. Uh, and then also how much anxiety is is the patient exhibiting and whether or not there's been any new change. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so and we've we've also taken that to focus on the therapist, too. And and that that's really enjoyable because is the therapist aware of the defenses that are happening in the session? And, you know, are they regulating anxiety? Are they exposing affect? Um, are they increasing a patient's motivation to change? Uh, so the the combo is pretty interesting because then you can like dive into interventions and and what's actually working or not. Excuse me a sec. I just want to jump in and say that there's a um, icon on the bottom for question and answer. Yeah. So if people in the audience have questions. Um, We'll be monitoring it and we'll be happy to break in and just uh, respond to your question as, as soon as we see it. So I, I, I wasn't anticipating asking a lot of questions of the interviewers, but Kristen, I, I have this strong felt sense. I have not gone and looked at the empirical research that, uh, again, just take ISDP, for example, that um, many therapists get so obsessed with the techniques and like following the steps of the central dynamic sequence in large part because of their own uh, defenses and you know react you know defenses against re emotional closeness that they you know they, they become therapist centered technique centered rather than client centered i'm curious mm -hmm. what your thoughts are about that or any of you yeah well i mean i i bet we all have thoughts about this um you know, and I, I'm thinking of Barbara, especially as like our expert in core conflict formulation, which is, you know, really at the heart of very good psychotherapy and and, and difficult to do well. And, you know, for me, I, I think a lot of therapists are anxious. Uh, they're they're anxious about, you know, serving their clients, doing a good job. And that anxiety can sometimes be so overwhelming that it can actually get in the way of the process. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so then we have therapists intellectualizing a lot and 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 really not um, uh, creating an atmosphere where where patients can truly open to experiencing their feelings. But you know we also are people too. We have our own. Uh, emotional conflicts and uh, tr trauma backgrounds, and and that certainly comes to play when when we're experiencing countertransference in a session too. So, so. I think you're a really good um, interviewer, Andre, because you're getting getting <laughs> a group to talk more than you're talking. And, uh, I just listened to a an interview with uh, Rick Rubin by um, by a guy named Klein who started to interview Rick, and and before he I knew it. Rick was pulling pulling Ezra Klein out of the uh, the closet, uh, so to speak, and getting him to go deep into his own stuff. So, getting back to you. Uh, <laughs> well, I want to ask Andre since you mentioned that um, you're receiving supervision, and by the way, I just applaud that. I think that is so great as a model that this field requires ongoing learning forever. Um, but could could you talk a bit about how you approach supervision and training um, with um, novice therapists or anybody that you're you know, teaching? Yeah, that's a great question because uh, I mean, 
I, I've been doing that pretty much my whole career. Even when I was a doctoral student, I was supervising, you know, first year's master's students, you know, and I still supervise first year master's students. And then I also supervise, you know, advanced doctoral students who've been, so some of these people have been practicing for 20 years after they got their master's and now are coming back for their PhD. And they actually have more hours under the belt than I do. Um, so obviously, you know, you're, um, it, it just depends because I, I must say as much, you know, most, you know, a good 80 or 90% of my published work is about integral and, and, and unification. But I, I have been somewhat obsessed with not just ICDP, but all of the EDTs, APT, AEDP, you know, I'm just, I really find them to be, I, I got so angry when I finally came across them because I had been in the field for like 20 years and didn't know about these principles and techniques that are so powerful and to me, self-evidently true. And so um, it makes it, but I, I have some uh, students, supervisees who are very defensive. They just want to be CBT therapists. And I can't help but think that that itself is a type of defense often. And um so, you know, where is the boundary between, you know, supervisor and therapist, you know, and if you're in the psychodynamic tradition, it's okay for that to be a more blurry line than other schools think so, you know, and so. Um, but just just for our viewers, though, Andre, when you say when you say ISTDP, could you let our viewers know what that what that is because yes. the everybody. question says excuse me like itp you refer to so that's what our questioner also would like yeah. i don't to. know what itp is i i sometimes <laughs> think that istdp is intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy created by habib davenlu and mm -hmm. uh, i think it was in the late 60s and you know he's still alive in his 90s and Correct me if I'm wrong, I think Kristen and Jeffrey know this better than I do, but I believe that, you know, many of the current experiential dynamic therapies basically respond, or maybe that's the wrong word. No, it's right. Bond is good. <laughs> offshoots of uh, his work. And he, um, he, I think his most important thing was his unique approach to defense work, right? So he is strongly in the psychoanalytic tradition, but, you know, Freud was very much about cognitive insight and interpretation. His method, you know, is this is, is he get, basically views cognitive responses as a type of defense. He's going for this visceral emotional experience. Get and rather than you know, of just basically a relentless confrontation of patients' defenses. But and, don't don't for, but don't forget though, uh, for those of you who don't know, his work. Although I don't think when I was in training with him, he ever get gave credit to Wilhelm Reich. Oh yeah, yeah, great yeah. character analysis wow. by um, Reich. Character armor. Yeah. Mo many of the technical interventions and conceptual uh, aspects of, I of intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy were pioneered by Wilhelm Reich, and before that, Sandor Ferenczi mm. and Alexander in French. Mm -hmm. So, a, a lot of times, people don't always give the people whose shoulders were standing on enough yeah. credit. So, I want to give them some credit because. They, yeah. they uh, laid the groundwork for him to, to advance his yeah. particular style. Thank you for adding that, Jeffrey. So, um, but j just to recognize things as defenses that I previously wouldn't. And then, of course, the discharge patterns of anxiety basically tell you, you know, if you need to stop pressuring and regulate anxiety, there's so many important principles that I... I and I think people like Michael Mahoney, who was a genius, just simply didn't know because they weren't exposed to this stuff. And it blows my mind that it's this is not a more common part of the training curriculum, you know. So, um, so I actually I actually find that the vast majority of my supervisees, my students, actually respond. You know, it, it, it they get really excited about these principles and concepts too, and. Um, um, so you, uh, your question was really about how, how, how different is the supervision with beginners versus more advanced people? Is that what you're saying? Well, that's part of it. I'd be interested in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, I mean, with my typical first year students, I would say the bulk of what I'm trying to get them to do is actually not so much to do things, but to get out of all of their previous socialization habits, right? 
hmm. to where, you know, uh, we've been trained not to interrupt people, but oftentimes as a therapist, you can't, you have to interrupt or you'll spend the whole session following defenses, you know, or the fact that, you know, somebody is clearly sad or angry, but they got a big smile on their face and they're just, the therapist is just smiling along with them. I'm like, okay, that's normal in society, but that is not, you want to mirror the actual aspect, not the defensive smile, you know? So it's, I see a lot of the supervision with beginning students is really getting them out of their habits, which are deeply ingrained. And that, that itself is not easy. And then after that comes more specific things. So, and, and then basic counseling skills like being empathic and genuine and present, right? So many, I mean, there are, M Michael Mahoney wrote so much about this, that, you know, you cannot neatly separate the personal from the professional in psychotherapy, right? I mean, being present, if you want to, I, I just can't think of that as a skill. That's a quality you have that in large part is what you do with your mind throughout your daily life. And um, we all know that the more present a therapist is, that's, that's a critical critical component. And then things like, again, how empath it's easy to be empathic with someone who's similar to you. <laughs> but when you have clients who are very different, whether it's ethnic, gender, sexual orientation, or value systems, or whatever, it gets more difficult. So empathy is a, that itself may be, it, it's not simple. It, 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 you know, it's, it's not the most complex skill in the world, but I think of it more of a human capacity than a intervention but but um and then again your capacity to be genuine you know, as carl rogers said it's not helpful to persistently pretend i feel differently toward a person than i actually do it doesn't mean you show every fleeting thought that comes to your mind but, but but if this person is chronically boring or you know you feel judged by them you know if that's pervasive that needs to be shared and again you might not use the word boring you might say i'm having a hard time remaining engaged or I feel like there's something operating as a barrier between us, but that, that you're genuine, that you don't pretend you like someone that you don't like. But then if you don't like them, you might have to explore what is it? Is, is this really them? Or is there something within me that I need to work on with my own therapist or supervisor? So those are kind of like mid, maybe mid, that's, I call those basic skills. And then if you want to get really good at cognitive restructuring or some kind of experiential dynamic therapy, then you're really getting into actually you know, teaching a lot of technical knowledge and then practicing skills. And I mean, my gosh, the mistakes I've made, it's been so humbling because, you know, I, I was in supervision constantly for like 10 years as a student and then didn't have a supervisor for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And then I'm back in the supervisee model trying to do a complex ISCP. And, um, you know, the great supervisor, Marvin Scorman, I mean, he was, he was, I think, one of Dan and Lou's right-hand men. And I remember the first year, he must have said a hundred times, you're in teacher mode again. Everything you're saying is true, but you're teaching, you're not doing therapy, <laughs> you know, or just things. And it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of stung to, but it was great. That's how you learn, right? To get, to get constructive feedback. Um, so, so I, I think I, you know, so I hope that gives a broad outline of the difference of, Andre, what got you into, you know, learning about how we work, our mind, counseling? What kind of led you down this path, would you say? Well, Just... good question. And <laughs> I suffered plenty. And I, unfortunately, I still suffer. It's, it's not as bad as it used to be. But um, uh, looking back, I was always very anxious as a child. I didn't know that word. Like in my high school, we didn't even have a psychology class. But I was constantly fidgeting and biting my nails and worrying and had trouble sleeping. And then I went to the University of Texas at Austin and majored in psychology, learned about anxiety. I'm like, oh my God, I was very okay. interested. <laughs> oh, that, <laughs> that's, that's, what that, that's, that's what it's called. Okay. Yeah. And then I also, around that same time, got introduced to Eastern philosophy and uh, contemplative spirituality by my girlfriend, my high school girlfriend's father, who was a physicist. Um, and um, I think those insights into suffering and, again, how our mind operates, and um, I, I guess I have a tendency to be fairly extreme, which is probably why I'm drawn to the integral model, which promotes balance, but um, I really, really was deeply contemplative for about 15 years, often meditated four hours a day, gave up all kinds of things from my fishing activities and was vegetarian, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that stuff, my experiences in meditation were not, 
fitting with what I was learning in, from Western psychology. And then I came across Ken Wilber, who I really, I think is widely regarded as, you know, he, he was, you know, they call him the Einstein of consciousness, or he certainly was the leader of the field of transpersonal psychology, which is like the interface of psychology and philosophy and spirituality. And it made a lot of sense all of a sudden that, you know, these, there are these different developmental levels and different states of consciousness and all this stuff. And it was just like, wow, it, uh, I, I read everything he wrote and he became my favorite, you know, thinker of all time. And that was even before uh, his 1995 book, Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, was this. So, so my interest in Wilbur was before he had even introduced the quadrants. I'm actually now... Um, so, so uh, there are a lot of things about Wilbur's spirituality that I strongly disagree with now. Mm. Um, and he, all, I also don't like the fact, again, as, as somebody who tries to be intellectually honest in my profession, he, he talks with certainty about things like the nature of reality before the Big Bang based <laughs> on his meditation experience, okay? So this is called the category error, and I've written about this. But um, so I don't I want to... So I now consider myself an atheist, not in the sense I know for certain about anything, but I do not have belief in God or whatnot. But I, the things I try to aspire to are like gratitude and mindfulness and compassion, and forgiveness and love, which I don't know a better word than spiritual for those things. So I consider myself a spiritual person, but not certainly not religious. And I, I consider myself a, a, an atheist spiritual person. <laughs> so, if you know, but... Uh, so that, uh, that you said you asked about my background. Is that what you said? <laughs> well, yeah, like what led you to, no, that was answering yeah. it. Yeah. So, uh, I think so, so suffering was what led, it, led me to it. I mean, yeah. and, um, I think spiritual paths can do, can do a lot for people suffering, but I think psychotherapy is different. I don't think, and again, there are tons of meditation teachers, Jack, Jack Cornfield, John Wellwood, who are very deeply psychological and they're like, you know, meditation teachers have their wounds too. Meditation by itself does not resolve trauma. It may make you, it may help you get a distance from it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, that, that ego observing capacity to where, you know, um, you're not so engulfed by it, but it doesn't resolve problems. And certainly like, things like personality disorders are not resolved on a meditation cushion. So I think that, you know, I, I, I think that, meditative contemplative practice I still there's tons of research showing the value of that I think that works together with psychotherapy I don't think one is a replacement for the other so you've kind of taken away like a more balanced view of it from where you started with it basically I would hope so but I, I, I don't know <laughs> I think I aspire to balance in my work because it's been something that hasn't come naturally yeah. I, I'll, I'll say this because my father doesn't isn't on the web but my father <laughs> Um, had plaque on his wall, the marquee proverb, and it said, if it's not worth doing to excess, it's simply not worth doing. So this was wow. like when I wanted to play something sports, about you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When I wanted to play sports, you could pick one because you can't be the best at more than one. Right. So this is how I grew up. So it was, you know, so I do, I, I do not think it's a coincidence that I'm drawn to a model that forces you to look at things from multiple perspectives, you know. <laughs> Um, wow. I appreciate you sharing like that. I mean, I think you're demonstrating here in this panel just the kind of authenticity and personhood that you're trying to encourage in your students, you know, that you can't just be a cold professional separated from your heart and, you know, genuineness. Yeah. Well, thanks, Barbara. I remember Carl Rogers, you know, it's funny that I have never, ever, ever considered myself Rogerian, ever, even though I have immense respect for him on so many levels. He actually has a remarkably coherent theory. Most people do not get it. And, you know, he was also the first person to record videos and study them. He has, you know, he is not given the credit, you know, anyway, but <laughs> he, he, he wrote something like, I have learned that what seemed impossible to share, what was most personal turns out to be the most universal. Mm. And that's been my experience that when I'm really vulnerable and take a risk to share something, half the class is like, yeah, me too, you know? Um, so I've been reinforced for it. Um, it's so true. It's, I, I mean, I've had to learn that over the years 
And, uh, you know, that phrase, like the, the truth will set you free. I, I think that the truth also connects mm -hmm. us with one another. Uh, and, and when you are being authentic and speak your truth, it, it's like people hear you and, and can respond. And, uh, I mean, I've, I've always found you to be very authentic, you know, as a, as a person and as a professional, and it's helped me like think outside the box, like be more creative in, in how I approach like problems, uh, but also, Andre, you're you're such a great role model too. Like, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of like, you know, um, being a, a a male professional and like being open and vulnerable and 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 talking about authenticity and how important it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I'm I'm sure your impact on your students is is uh, really high. Well, thanks. We have something in the question answer. Um, just a comment, but it would be great for you to respond to it. Um, Martin Scorman has spoken of meditation as a defense. Um, yeah, I mean, really anything can be used as a defense, right? So even like, you know, it's so, it's, I could never, per, per, so be sure I would comment on that. But, but back when I had my, my first uh, girlfriend we were together for almost four years and it was her dad that got me into the eastern contemplative stuff when we had conflict so i've always been deeply 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 passionate about music i almost went into that as a field a profession um i remember when we when we would be engaged in a fight or a conflict like bach and stuff would come into my head and i could i would see her talking and i couldn't hear her words i would just hear music <laughs> And, and again, this was pre even knowing about psychology, but I'm looking back, I'm like that I've never heard of that defense before, but like music, would, well, some kind of, diso I mean, I don't have a you know, type of dissociation, maybe, I don't, but you say, oh, well, Bach is great, it's sublime. Well, that can be used as a defense if, it, if it's to avoid feeling and interpersonal processes. And so, yeah, I mean, I have known, I've had a lot of friends who were really probably considered advanced meditators. I mean, I actually, in my doctoral program, I minored in EEG, biofeedback, neurofeedback. And I know this sounds horrible. It just shows the, my lack of development, certainly at that point in time, but we would compete. So we, we, we would all get these brain maps on and, and see like who could get into alpha and theta and delta states faster. It's like, yeah, this is really the point of spirituality, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, Oh, oh, but yeah, so, so you, you, yeah, I mean, you can just use meditation skills. I mean, Francis Vaughn, Roger Walsh have written a great deal about this, about how any of these spiritual practices, am I transcending or is this some kind of repression, right? I mean, again, especially if you're doing some kind of concentrated meditation where you put your attention on something, whether it's a mantra or an image or, you know, it's like, okay, great. The more you're focused on that, the, the, the more you're distracted and avoiding your anger or your sadness or whatever so yeah absolutely meditation can be a defense you know i think anything can be like look thoughts i, I have a client right now who's a professor in the mental health field and she talk about rationalizing and intellectualizing and she and she's like you know my intellect is what saved my life and it's like yeah that's great and it can also be the very thing keeping you from facing what you need to face right so it's not like i'm trying to get rid of your intellect but in this moment right here it's the thing that is preventing you from facing your feelings so thank you so Andre like what 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 does the future hold for you like what objectives are you moving toward professionally you you have this paper you're working on yeah it's really funny about about five or six months ago I literally felt I had run out of ideas and, and like, I don't know what I'm going to do next, you know? And, and then all of a sudden I, I now have five papers I'm working on. It's, it's just like, there, you know, there was a lull there and. Um, uh, what, and with the five papers, like what, what are the topics that, that are hot for you at the moment? So one of them is, you know, normal up my alley. It's an integral analysis of the etiology and treatment of substance use disorders. And then there's this uh, ICP as a person-centered approach. And then the other 
three papers are things I'm doing with uh, doctoral students, you know, primarily to help them get their first publications. And one of them is applying the integral model to supervision. Mm. And then there are two papers on intergenerational resilience from an integral perspective, like both the factors that contribute to it and then how to intervene. So I guess, well, four out of the five still have integral going on. Um, we have a question. I want to interrupt. Um, how have your students taken to EDT in your classes? This is a complicated model to teach, I should think. How has that gone for you? So, you know, it's funny. <laughs> I, you know, as a doctoral student, I co authored um, a text on theories of counseling and psychotherapy that's now in its fourth edition. I've always been kind of a theory head. That's the, I'm more of a rational person than an empirical researcher. You know, it's just what comes naturally to me, conceptual stuff. And um, so again, of all the classes I teach, what I am most expert in is theory. And I, I have never published a paper or done any research on group counseling, but my, my evaluations in the group classes are like twice as good as my theory classes. <laughs> But then I, I created this class on ISVP and other EDTs. I use Lee McCullough's books, FOSHA, you know, Fredrickson, Abbas, some that, you know, I don't use the Dabble New Book, but, you know, some of them. And um, that used to be every other year. And anyway, I would struggle to get like six people. I have to turn people away. It's offered every year now. It's become like everybody in their evaluation is like, this must be mandatory for everybody. So, you know, a, a certain few percentage... I, that class is half didactic and half experiential where they actually practice the techniques with one another. And then I am so fortunate, and I'm sure, I'm sure that Jeffrey and Kristen can speak to this. There's something about the world of EDT, experiential dynamic therapies, where I, in my experience, everyone is so giving. So for example, Marvin Scorman used to my, come to my class. He retired in December of 2021. He would come two nights a week. That it goes from 7:30 until 10:15 at night. This wow. guy in his 70s, and he would speak the whole time and show his tapes. And you know, he knows this stuff so much better than me. Kristen, Kristen's come and, and and zoomed into my class before. You know, <laughs> I have and there's I, I I have brought in so many EDT people who are more experienced than I do, and so. It's a really rich class in terms of, you know, what they read and they get stuff not just from me, but I had two doctoral students who took that class like eight years ago. One of them has been in core training with John Fredrickson for like five years. And another one had uh, supervision with Marvin Scorman for three years. They've been volunteering no money at all for the past five years so that now we can have groups of four supervision so that, you know, small group supervision for all, of, you know, all of them are really skilled. So, you know, again, the class is hands-on. Uh, it's not just you're reading stuff and thinking about it. They're practicing it and getting supervision. So, you know, that has nothing to do with the bulk of my scholarly work, but I love, that's probably my favorite class to teach. I teach advanced doctoral theories classes, these things that are so up my alley, and I like those, but I must say my passion right now is in these EDTs. Maybe it's because I have so much to learn in them, you know, um, but, and again, I, I just have to thank Jeffrey and Kristen. Yeah, I remember I was like, I've been reading Abbas and Fredrickson and I think Jeffrey goes, go to the source, man, referring to David Lou. And then Kristen wrote her little letter, her, I shouldn't say little, but, you know, wrote her letter of reference, which, you know, she probably regrets at this point, but. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I just think it would be all great for us to be in Montreal, like doing this live. That's all. <laughs> uh, so, no, it, it's fantastic seeing your excitement uh, with the EDTs, because I remember when it was new to you and and now you're just tossing out everyone's names and, and you obviously know the work quite well and, and you're teaching know students. That. Yeah, <laughs> so... Yeah. I mean, what what do you think it is about the EDTs for you that that creates so much excitement and enthusiasm? And well, look, I mean, so for the last 10 years, the people I see are not only self-pay, but they drive about an hour from Rochester to, to see me. Or now it's on Zoom. 
but so I'm not, so this is not a representative sample of everyone who needs counseling. So truly that is one of the great things about the integral model. Like you're looking at their systems and like, so, you know, if, if you had a lot of people living in poverty and a lot of minorities or gay clients who are experiencing, you know, persistent discrimination and oppression, then that might be the focus of the work. But for the last 10 years, it's become real clear to me that the bulk of my clients' problems have been chronic as opposed to acute. Mm. I, I really welcome all of your opinions here. I see no evidence. Now, again, if someone is going through an acute problem, like they've had a death of a loved one or lost of a job, I think cognitive therapy can be useful. If someone needs coping skills, CBT can be useful. But when someone's been depressed for 20 years or anxious for 20 or 30 years or has a personality disorder, I don't see regular cognitive therapy helping. Mm. And I, uh, to me, these things, the, the, all these patterns were set in play at emotional levels, often pre-verbal. Um, they were, you know, emotional traumas, if not physical and sexual traumas. Mm. And that reason doesn't get to those. And that it has to be working. And again, because, you know, in response to those traumas, people have erected these walls of defense that it, no, you know, what is it that we say? You can't reason with the superego, right? It's like you need to connect and get past those walls. And I don't see, you know, Beck even talking about defenses, let alone knowing how to work with them, you know? So to me, and also these, these things like recognizing clients' projection of will and compliance, these things I never used to recognize until I got into these approaches because they make, mm. they, they say how important it is to recognize them. And so often, you know, I was assuming too much responsibility and th that, that the clients were being compliant. They weren't really, it wasn't their will to invest. And mm. that by recognizing these principles and recognizing when um, it, it's not, that, that they don't have their will fully online and posting on that, once they do get it online, then therapy starts going again. And um, I, I, I just have seen people who, you know, you know, you're the 20th therapist I've seen. And, you know, in the first few months they're saying they're getting more benefit than anything else and it's not so much unfortunately from integral it's from the edt stuff that is doing this you know mm. um i just see that i really i'm curious about you know your y'all's all of your perspectives on this notion of when you have chronic problems that again you know I'm really uncomfortable saying this because Jeffrey and I talk about the importance of all these domains, cognitive being one of them, but I just don't see cognitive work uh, producing like long lasting change when you're talking about these kind of chronic problems. And I'll just cite the Shedler meta-analyses that, that, or this article that talks about how many meta-analyses have shown that the effect sizes of CBT ther therapies always diminish over time. Whereas most uh, trials of psychodynamic therapy, they continue to get better and better after therapy ends. Hmm. That's a robust finding. It's not, it wasn't, it's just not a study or two. So can y'all comment on that? Well, I'll comment just to, um, I, again, it's like this feeling of unification or integration that it's not either or so much. So when you, when you first spoke, um, I was thinking, of the power of schema therapy, you know, yeah. um, Jeffrey Young's early maladaptive schemas and how excited I was when I first discovered that because it provides a link, you know, with psychodynamic. And I think once, once the patient gets into the origins of, they identify the beliefs and they get into the origins and why they hold on to it, then I think if the therapist can't switch into affect, you know, then it just stays on, uh, it doesn't get to the real important issue. So that was my I'm, reaction. I'm so glad you said that because what I always tell my students is, and so, you know, Greg Henriquez worked with Aaron Beck for like five years. I think he published 15 articles with him. And and they, I have watched at least a hundred video demonstrations of expert cognitive therapists. I never see them working at the schema level. So, so I, I, I truly, truly, truly believe that if you're working at the schema level, that that's roughly equivalent to EDT work. But 
the, there's a reason why Jeffrey Young had to say this is schema therapy and not cognitive therapy. And right, that he integrated Gestalt and all kinds of other things to get to the experiential component. And I just don't see without that visceral experiential component, I don't see that chronic stuff changing. But one of on. our participants has written, I once asked David Burns a question about defense, and he asked me in all seriousness, what, what is, is defense? Ah. <laughs> he froze. Andre froze. He's so shocked. We went into the screen. <laughs> that was our best moment yet. There he is. Exactly. He didn't eat what the defense. Exactly. Beck, Beck wouldn't know a defense if it hit him in the face, man. <laughs> So I've had I've been having an experience that I talked to uh, Annie about um, recently. So one of the things that has been happening is that I have new people come in to see me, mm. and they sit down in the chair across from me, right over there. And before anything happens, well, not, that's I shouldn't say that. Before I ask them anything, they start to well up. Mm. And I have gotten to the point where I say, just sit with that. And what usually happens is this outpouring of grief with, mm. I don't know the person, I haven't asked them what their issues are, but it's happened like five or six times in the last maybe month where new people sit down and they, and, and, and I've been, sort of wondering what, what you all think about that as a phenomenon, like what is that? I have an idea, but I, I would certainly, I would defer to, to, to y'all, but uh, my thought is that the, before even you speak a word, if you're going to a therapist, there is some awareness, even if you don't know much about therapy, that you're expected to open up and, and, and get emotionally close. And what is it that has harmed people, right? They've been traumatized and hurt by, you know, usually parents in these close relationships. And here, I mean, it's so funny for me to be talking to you. And, you know, y'all know this. You've written more beautifully about this than I have both. Of you. But that, you know, we simultaneously long for that intimacy. Mm. Completely terrified of it, right? Mm. And so mm -hmm. even before a word is spoken, their, yeah. their, some of their anxiety is through the roof, right? Yeah. Um, terrified of being ha having their, those same kind of experiences happen again. Yeah. I mean, did, did that sound right to you, Jeffrey? Or yeah, 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 that works so well um, with the people that I work with because I think a lot of them are, you know, being in the acute inpatient setting, institutionalized. They'll often feel like, "Ooh, this is a bad emotion. I can't feel it. I shouldn't feel this. I should, you know, like run from it or whatever." And you know, people are like trying to instantly soothe them, like you're okay, and to be like, "Hey." let's just sit with this right now. They're like, okay, so maybe this is okay. And it opens up, you know, a nice space for them to, so that really works with, with my population. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I sometimes will say, let's just honor this and let's create a space for this to be whatever it is right now. I'll, I'll ask you the questions about why you're, why are you here in a couple of minutes? So let's just and it, it seems like it. What it does is it is it creates an instant um, attachment bond. Mm. Positive, I guess the 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 uh, short term dynamic therapy people would call it, or the relational people would be called an in, an instant secure and safe attachment um, bond to start with, which is pretty cool when that happens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Jeffrey, I've been seeing that in my office and I've actually been asking myself to just chill, you know, and, and, and try to like regulate my energy so that, you know, when someone comes in and they're just so available emotionally that I'm not, I'm not interrupting with chit chat or talk or, or being oblivious to it. It's yeah, almost yeah. like, I, cause you get excited to meet someone for the first time and you, you know, you have like the paperwork and the questions and, and there's all these rituals around it. And 
I I'm, I'm like telling myself just chill out, like be ready because people are opening quickly. So I think it's still, I think it's a hard time. I, I think um, the pandemic has impacted all of us and not everyone uh, is in a position to be talking about it openly, at least how I do when, when I'm at home with like my friends and, and family. And so uh, the, the ripple effect is, is happening. Yeah. I met with a guy last night who said he called a hundred therapists and he's in the Boston area and none of them were available. Right. One yeah. of our attendees, I just want to uh, pop in. Um, they're just relieved at finally finding a safe place. And mm -hmm. I, I just know all of us agree how yeah. safety is. And that's why, you know, sometimes like you can be a therapist for a long time and then all of a sudden there's a trust and safety and it's like everything changes. And so... Mm -hmm. Thank you for writing that. Don't forget Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> right. right. Absolutely. Yeah. Andre, I have a question for you. For new therapists and counselors in the field, what advice or words of wisdom or hope can you give to the people out there in the field? <laughs> Hmm. That's a that's great, sweet. but tough question, you know. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's great. That, that, that's great. Um, I'm just, you know, somebody, I don't know who said this, said something, and I, I, hope, I hope the way I'm saying it is not offensive to anyone, but like therapy is is not a young person's profession. <laughs> like, the, you know, the idea that, you know, uh, I think I'm kind of pulling this out of my butt, but I think that you could be a pretty darn good auto mechanic or even a even a heart surgeon or certainly a musician you know in your 20s you know early 30s but my sense is that psychotherapy is so complex you know it's not about following a manual you know it's and again you know to use I you know we all the therapists have their own triangle of conflict their own anxiety and defenses right and um and then again, oftentimes we, you know, we get we get enamored or obsessed with a certain approach that works with some people, but no approach, even ISDP, whatever, nothing works with everybody. So I, I mean, one of the things I admire so much about Jeffrey is my God, how many how many seminars and workshops he's EMDR and he's going in training in this and this and that, right? Just constantly being open. I think I think a, com a commitment to both lifelong professional learning and then also a deep commitment to knowing yourself. And I think that's where our, our own therapy, our own meditative spiritual practices, I think it's a really, um, I, I guess, I, yeah, if I had to say one thing, it's just being open to lifelong learning, you know, that, and to know that not, and, and to not feel guilty that you're not helping all your clients when you're young. First of all, I don't, I don't think any therapist at any age helps all of their clients. But, you know, when I look back on, like my, when I was a master's student, you know, I feel sorry for some of those clients, you know, I mean, it's like, there's no way I was being as helpful as, this <laughs> yeah. as I am now, you know, um, and so it's like having a balance, you know, so, some people think like, you know, I, I have them do these assignments where they, where they critique, they evaluate themselves. And I have to say, being excessively critical is not good. In the same way, if you did really poorly and thought it was all great, that's not good. But if you did well, do you think it was all crap? That's equally poor. Right. So I, I want you to become as accurately, objectively of yourself and to recognize what you're doing well and what are your areas for improvement, which we all have. You know what I mean? Marvin Scorman would always say, my, my, my favorite supervisor, I'm a work in progress like everybody else, you know. And so um, so to be committed to that lifelong learning and then to accept yourself as you're still so far from perfect, you know, and I think there's a steeper learning curve in therapy than Again, I'm drawing this out of my butt. I don't know for a fact, but it seems like there's a steeper learning curve in therapy than a lot of other professions. Um, well, probably, yeah. Yeah, experience, experience, experience. But we do know that experience by itself does not produce, right? We, this is this whole thing of deliberate practice. And again, you know, like people like me who are in their 50s and still getting supervision, it's like, I think that willing, if, if people who 
think that because I've had a couple thousand hours that I'm a good therapist, that's dangerous, right? If you're not willing to uh, put your work under scrutiny and or or use like standardized assessments like the Miller school type people, like, you know, are you doing anything to ensure that, you know, there's a lot of research showing that therapists are actually quite poor in their assessments of how well their clients are doing, you know? So again, I think that that humility and being open to the fact that there's still a lot that we can all learn, I think is just critical. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Okay, I'll do one more question for you. How do you take care of yourself personally? Yeah, great question. So um, I'm fortunate to have a lot of really great relationships with people. Some of them are psychotherapists. Some of the people who never went to school, but I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm obsessed with fishing. I, I, so I love the outdoors. I live I live 45 miles south of Rochester because I like living where bears walk in my yard and I can just walk out into the woods and I'll be sitting here working and there's an eagle fly by this this you know so so nature is incredibly so I don't sit on a cushion anymore but my walks through the woods are very meditative. I have a dog that just brings out the child in me you know and. I listen to a lot of music, like really, like just with headphones in the dark, just focusing. Um, I love to cook and, you know, uh, I eat too much, but I eat healthy food, <laughs> but I, I, I love cooking and eating and, you know, I love to drink wine and, you know, uh, I wish I could be a little bit more moderate, but, you know, um, so, you know, good friends that I love fishing and hiking, my dog, my wife, uh, and the colleagues like y'all. I mean, you know, we, we've hung around in, 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 the, in the hotels after the conferences and just, you know, this is, I mean, you know, uh, I normally it would be so anxious to do this kind of thing, but with, <clears throat> Bar yeah, I know all of you, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> just this great, you know, great friends who I knew aren't going to try to like make me look stupid or something. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think that would be possible. <laughs> I don't think so either. <laughs> That's also the safety factor, right? Yeah. So it's like a safety, a sense of safety is so powerful. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. true. All right. Someone ask him one more question. Come on. One okay, more. I have one. I have one. <laughs> I always ask this one. So do you think therapists are born or can we make therapists? <laughs> yeah, <that's> the <laughs> uh, I know that I know they can be made because I was not a natural. <laughs> uh, here, here, I remember so I had my first I've had all you know we've all had lots of supervisors, right? You know, and I had so many horrible supervisors, but my first one was really good. His name was John Garcia at uh, Southwestern Texas State University. And uh, we had a we had a one way glass, you know, or, you know, right, right, he's watching in real time, and uh, you know, by nature, I'm pretty analytical. And this was my first session ever with a client, and you know, I'm thinking the task of a therapist is to figure out what's wrong with them, and you know, tell them that and fix them, you know. Anyway, I, I thought I had a really good first session. I wasn't as anxious. As I, I came around, and he goes, "She won't be back." <laughs> she, <laughs> and she didn't come back, you know. Uh, but, <laughs> I do appreciate that kind of blunt feedback. <laughs> she won't be back, <laughs> and uh, no, she never came back. But uh, <laughs> I had to, I had to unlearn a whole lot. <laughs> he even made me change my glasses. You know, I, I was like so, oh, wow. I was trying to be so focused that he goes, "You're so intense." You know, you. I had like these wire rim glasses. He goes, "You got to change your clothes. You got to change everything, man." You, <laughs> you just like. Anyway, so I know, I know, I know it can be learned, but, but I do agree with Yalom who said we would be better off if we spent more time selecting who we train than, <laughs> yeah, yeah certain, I have had, I have had students in their first year, I'm like, I wasn't this good 10 years later. I'm like, you know, it's like, you know, so, so there, there's certainly some people are natural at it, but again, I think, I mean, Again, I'm not saying I am a master. I'm, I feel fortunate to be on the show, but you know, I know that I have become a good therapist and it was not natural to me. Bravo. <laughs> oh.
I think it's time to say that our, we're going to be hitting the ending time of this meeting, but we'll turn off the <clears throat> recording. And after this recorded session, we do hang around for informal chatting. Um, <laughs> or laughing. And thank or laughing. you for joining us tonight. And thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>